Welcome back. Welcome back. Okay. Everybody, welcome back. I hope you had good discussions in the breakaway sessions. Um, so in terms of this break of the breakaway session that we had, we had two intentions. One was to engage with the case studies themselves, the real life situations in the case studies. The second one was to, to, to understand the application of a systems approach towards understanding a complex or messy situation. So I'm joined by the group leaders. Um, so if we could allow them to come into the into the discussion, and and I'm going to ask um, Begazeli, what did you come up with from your conversation in your rooms? What did you find that was insightful from uh, from your room, Begazeli, around uh, the case studies? What were some of the insights? And 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 I'm really listening to those three things that we were talking about. One of it being around the interrelationships and how those are creating the complexity, the interdependence, or the lack of relationships. The, the second one, this idea of the multiple perspectives, the different perspectives of the different stakeholder and stakeholding interests. Uh, and, and third is, is really to listen out to what are the kind of blind spots, the kind of unintended consequences we are hearing in those case studies. So we are trying to see if we use a different lens to look at those case studies of systems thinking, does that enable us to see something different? So Begazeli, just ca come on and tell us what, uh, how was your discussion? What are some of the insights that came from your conversations? Uh, first of all, we only discussed the first case study because the participants uh, stated that the the second one was clearly dissected and analyzed by the speaker so they couldn't really um what can i say draw something of their own or rather everything was given to them at that time so but one thing that they have mentioned broadly was uh especially when it comes to relationships that um that there were a lot of them uh there were a lot there were a lot of interrelations to, to a point where the there could be uh uh, what um an, a, a not seamless flow of information since there are a lot of interlinked relationships and that could have led to of course um according to 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 the word cloud one that 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 um that one word that pops up the most was there would be slow communication that that would also lead to business failure and also different so basically it will take time for a decision to be reached since there are a lot of people that need to be contacted or rather communicated mm -hmm. with before a specific decision that was made. So that is simply mm -hmm. the overall that um, insight that was taken from in terms of relationships from the from the first case study. And may you please repeat the second question, sir? Well, the, the second question was really to understand who are the different stakeholders, what are the kind of issues coming from that. But also, um, uh, I, I guess we don't have to ask question by question, but also to just say, um, where did you hear some of these blind spots? Where did you hear some of the unintended consequences? So we're just trying to draw out what did we hear from the case studies. Uh, so basically the overall thing so regarding the blind spots and the unintended consequences so one of the participants spoke broadly here about the, the 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 regulations that uh the systems are strongly regulated to a point where the regulations uh hinder the 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 the, 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 the people from doing what they are supposed to do so basically there is too, uh, too much restraint and constraint you know so now projects cannot uh, go on as as they they supposed to you you know as 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 quick as supposed to which also goes back to of course the relationships now with the consequences by the relationships consequences by the by the regulations now it may lead to a huge business failure so basically in all overall that that is what was discussed in the different sessions and also one of the participants also spoke that actually that is one thing that she personally has experienced since she's also a protection uh practitioner uh herself so that is what was given over that was drawn overall Okay, okay. Uh, and and, and uh, I don't know whether you are able to share any of the word clouds that you came up with. 
Um, the word clouds. Um, I would gladly share this one. Right. I hope you are able to see my screen. So I will share. And 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 while while Begazeri is is preparing to share that, just to mention that for me as a as a practitioner within the the systems thinking field, part of the challenge I find, for example, even here now where I am working with government departments and so on, is you take people to a workshop and they come from there and they are like, wow, this is great. We need to do systems thinking. And I saw some of your comments on the chat, people saying we need more systems thinking and so on. Now that's what they do when they are in the workshop session with you. When they get back to work, they go back to work and they are back into completing templates and schedules and so on. And, 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 and now you can and tick box and you kind of find this dissonance between what now they know around system thinking, the need for consultation, the need for what, all those things that we are talking about. And so that's one dilemma I actually want to pose to the group, to all of us, because there's this dilemma of we come from here, we're very excited about systems thinking, and then we get out there and the messiness is such that it's managed using schedules, templates, what, uh, tick boxes, and we go back to our business as usual. So I guess that's part of the dilemma. So Begazeli, just, just on to you for a moment. Oh, yes. I hope you can see my screen. So basically, these are the words that we have, um, that were found on the on, on, on the word cloud after um, a, a discussion, a thorough discussion on the face, uh, on the insights. Uh, of the first case study. So these were the words found. I hope you can see them. Okay, okay. This was from the first case study. Yes, um, as stated before that the second one, the participant, uh, participant suggested that we don't discuss for the speaker had dissected and analyzed it thoroughly for them. So there was yeah. no, yeah. basically yeah. something they could find for, for themselves. So, and the and, second- And then on the blind the, spots? Blackboard and unintended consequences. Yes, this is what we found on the blind spots and okay. unintended okay. consequences. Okay, okay. Yes. So the, the same issues around communication, around community buy-in, uh, around uh, contractor satisfaction, the like the supply chain in many organizations you go to in many municipalities, these supply chain is like a swear word. Um, and so those are the kind of issues that we are dealing with. And then they, it creates this municipal slowness so that although people do want to deliver something, then there is this just slowness in how it is done. Yes, yes. Wow. Okay. Good, good. Thank you, Begazeli. Thank you very much. Thank you so, and so please, much, guys, uh, Mr. Jane. And please, okay. People on the chat, can you talk to us as well what, what you're picking up from some of these things? Because we, we, we are also seeing it from one side of the facilitator, but maybe there are other things that are coming up. Paul, what came up in your group? Hello, Samuel. Um, yeah, it's a very uh, interesting discussion uh, and uh, a lot of uh, interesting ideas shared in there. So talk about the bit of uh, solutions uh, from also from that perspective and um, yeah a lot of problems a lot of questions um, I can share my screen I've made the PDF mm -hmm. of the slides uh, let's share this so uh, my uh, breakfast session was we came from it uh, from Firstly, we talked about the insights gain. And uh, the, the, one of the key issues that was brought up was uh, the problem of, you know, um, timing it. Since these projects take too long and then there's the uh, disparity between the um, incentives uh, you know, on a political uh, level and also on a functional level um, for these projects uh, at, at all different stages. And then also, like, um, 
you know, what might be the possible breakdowns, you know, in that, in the chain, um, all the way down to, you know, the municipal project level. And also, um, just the disparity between, you know, what resources are available at the national level and then also, you know, what remains at the local level and the planning level. And also a very interesting um, perspective brought up was, um, when do people join in a, on a project? You know, when are um, stakeholders involved? Um, how can we ensure trust? Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a very complex um, process to manage. It was very enriching to see, you know, the assumptions we have, you know, maybe it's just such a simple thing, but there's actually so many factors that come into play that has to be considered. And mm. there's very interesting problems and very interesting and it's exciting to see what uh, possible solutions there are to improve. Yeah. 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 And 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 and, I, and I'm glad you're raising that because the, the, the one of the realities we face when we when when we look at something like a rich picture of a situation when we engage with uh, with with a situation and we try to map it out, one of the things we get to is oh my goodness, this is complex. And, and, and that's good. That's good. Because if we work with, it's better to work from that point of, oh, wow, service delivery is complex. And therefore, then we are going into it in terms of trying to learn to understand, rather than the other side where we assume it's project management 101, we do one, two, three, four, and people live happily ever after. So I'm glad if there is that level of uh, that level of discomfort, Paul, that makes us feel like, wow, this is hectic. And so even looking at the words there, it's taking too long. Planning is good on paper. Uh, scarcity of resources, compliance of regulations, uh, complexity, unpredictable. So the moment we get there now, we're starting to wrestle with real complexity in the real world. Do you feel like that? Yeah, I, I do definitely agree. And just the real world, we live in very interconnected systems. We can't take something yeah. in a vacuum and think we can solve a problem in a vacuum. And I think we maybe lose perspective of what is important, what is the problem we're trying to solve. You know, we're trying to grapple this complexity and then we must actually be like, no, we must build this project here at this local level and then get a bit lost, you know, trying to solve all these problems and manage the complexities. So that's where systems thinking comes in, like, um, like you propose. And also, I think also design thinking. What are we designing the system towards? You know, to meet the bottom up, to the people and the system the projects that need to be addressed so yeah it's very interesting mm, mm. i can move to the second uh, no. the second um, yeah please slide. do so um yeah we talked about the possible blind spots and uh, uh unintended consequences it's um sometimes if you don't involve our, the whole community into it and you know through the whole the process from the start um you know Feedback might not be so good on these projects, and you know maybe we also don't plan the scope um, too well. There can also be possible you know, hindrance to the project, and also just again, um, there can be conflict between municipalities for resources that can also be a blind spot that maybe municipalities don't assess, or you know from wherever it's planned, it bring that into the perspective and. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot about we talked about maybe um, measures to remedy this is actually getting some private sector involvement and in it was a yeah, very interesting perspective shared again. Mm. And yeah. Mm. 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 That's from that. Yeah, and, and again involving private sector brings other complexities that also then need need to be managed as well. Yeah. Look at the issues around blind uh, blind spots, unintended consequences around scope creep, cost escalation, community rejection, and stuff like that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, definitely. It was very but, interesting. And yeah, we also talked about, yeah, there is definitely complexities of involving the private sector. So yeah, it's going to take a lot of, I'd say, systems thinking ar around that and managing incentives and going on like that. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And Raluca is adding the question of customization. If you're trying to say this is a community that needs this particular project, so you've got to de develop the project for that particular community, it comes with its own challenges. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. And your group. Thank you. Thank you. Good, 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 good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sipesiche, where are you? What are the insights that, and, and I think as we listen to this, it's very interesting. You can hear the same kind of th uh, themes coming out even from the different breakaway sessions around some of the things that we picked up, around some of these intricacies are of community development so that we are, and service delivery, so that we are not, uh, you know, that, that's a problem of project management 101. It is almost like plan to execute what, done. And yet, life is different from that. Sipa Shisha, what, what did you come up with? Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but what my group and uh, myself has identified is that there is um, a huge gap between the community and the municipality. By that, I mean there are mm. there is no alignment in terms of the goals. The community mm. decides to build stuff for the community, but does not include them in the planning, which... Um, further disassociates the society, the community from the planning because then they could there is conflict there is crime some of it caused by the community members also um because the municipality is just doing this for themselves or their own like benefit um it's like they don't care so there is um a lot of contractual issues uh, there is improper planning um, also, it's just being done for the sake of being done. That's what I've noticed from the response that I've also gained. Can you guys see my slides yet? Uh, not yet. Um, not yet. Okay. And yet, Sipe, as you prepare through. to share them, Sipe, as you prepare to share the slides, yet if you talk to the government or the municipal officials, everybody you talk to says we are consulting and they will show you registers of where they've consulted. If you talk to the community members, they will say, we were never consulted. I think somebody earlier brought the question of ETOLs and so on. If you ask the people who are running it, they will say, we consulted. If you ask the people on the ground, we were not consulted. So that those are the kind of things that come up, is that even this consultation, what is it? OK, carry on, Sipe. Yes, um, also the question is, are the people that they're consulting directly benefiting from the project? Because I feel like the people that they're consulting, it's just experts that can build the project that have maybe conducted research that the community can benefit, but also they are not even sure. So also mm -hmm. the consulting also comes down, boils down to who are they consulting as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Also the yeah. some of the insights that we have um, identified include, um, corruption, vision, um, the, the, there's usually a vision, a lack of vision alignment when it comes to stakeholders, also a lack of communication, um, also lack of communication might lead to uh, improper project planning, which leads to uh, more costs in terms of a project, also delays in terms of the project, also creating a, um, a project or infrastructure that not necessarily benefits the community as much as it should. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, we have identified yeah. in the insights gained. Okay. Just put it in uh, and, slideshow uh, so we can moving see. Moving right along to the possible. Can you put it in slideshow so we can see a bigger okay. view? In slideshow. Um, how can I do that? Um, oh, yes, got it. Okay. I think this is it. Can you guys see it? Um, okay. Um, while you're there, Heschel, as here there is a hand. I was trying to find the hand now. Heschel? Are you, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment on what CPC was uh, speaking about just now, because in the framing session, um, you mentioned the um, the issue of 
the silo mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in the project that we discussed, there's the, uh, it comes into play clearly where there's, there are stakeholders who are, who are dependent on one another in, um, throughout the process of getting these projects to completion. But those stakeholders also have a responsibility um, themselves to comply with certain regulations of ex- so for example mm-hmm. with the, mm-hmm. the issue um, that was mentioned in the first project with uh, with the MFMA um, that, that that they had to be complied with there and, yeah. and how that yeah. impacted and delayed delayed the completion um, of that project and then because um, then I feel like the the issue of that silo mentality also then feeds into um, the lack of social cohesion that you see mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. as um, as government, especially local government, there's a big responsibility to foster that type of trust between um, the community itself and then their, their local uh, government or their municipality. And that's, yeah. that's the point of, of doing projects like like these is to feed into those communities and give them something um, that they can almost be proud of and something that they can feel like they contributed towards by being consulted. So then, like I said, the silo mentality of we have to comply with regulations um, feeds into that lack of social cohesion and then perpetuates other uh, 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 um, issues that we might also then pick up within those communities where we are trying mm-hmm. to implement mm-hmm. these types of mm-hmm. projects. So the issues that are around silos. And, I, and I'm glad you're raising that because we need to question even things like the integrated development plan process and ask ourselves, you know, who attends those integrated development plan processes and who participates. But actually what you find is that when the ultimate document comes out on the other end, um, who are the actual voices that get listened to and make their way into that plan? And, and those are interesting conversations that you're bringing around the, the question of uh, the consultation. Do we, need to go, uh, do we need to go beyond consultation to something else that ensures ownership? I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point, Heshal, you're raising there. Okay, Sipet, back to you. Oh, yes. And I definitely um, agree with Heshan because I believe that if the community feels more involved in the project, then they'll be more supportive of the project. They'll also be able to like to, co- to uh, bring in expertise that they have also um, like be supportive in terms of um, not av- making sure that there's no um, crime activities I- involved in the project. The project does not get delayed any much further just to ensure that the project goes well because they know very well that they are going to benefit from it. And like yeah. um, getting a project that is built for you, but not knowing how you're going to benefit from it, then what? why would you want to ensure that the project goes well? You won't even care if the project gets delayed or yeah. even gets canceled. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, looking at the possible blind spots and unintended consequences, this is what we have identified um, as a group. Mm the Mm -hmm. impact of families, uh, impact on families, the community pushback, which is caused by lack of involvement, the unclear plans, the incompetence, the the, one of the unintended consequences will be like lack of service delivery, also the cost overruns, which are caused by the possible blind spots that have either been uh, ignored um, that could also um, have been prevented in the first place, given that mm-hmm. um, there was mm-hmm. involvement of people also the, also given that there was proper planning and proper expertise that was involved. Wow, wow, wow. And again, look at this from your group as well, like the other groups, the questions of community pushback, the questions of incompetence, the questions of cost overruns, the issues around the, the lack of that act project actually being delivered and so service delivery conflicts of interest. It's the same themes that we are hearing in terms of these blind spots and unintended consequences as well. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Thank you to you and your team. Thank you. 
Thank you so Carla, much. Carla, what came from your group? Hi, Samuel. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. I'll um, try and give you a quick update. Okay. So I think the main theme from our discussion was based on the disconnect and mismatch in terms of inter um, relationships between the stakeholders. So essentially, you know, how government needs to take into account who they are serving and the needs of those that they are serving, which sometimes gets um, neglected. And, and the context, right, the background of that. And um, another thing that, that came out was that um, – the whole thing of people centric. So economists seem to to look at the numbers and the policies and the objectives and everything and you know in, in this logical manner, but um we need to understand that the policy is for someone or the project is for someone and mm -hmm. what are the needs of those that it is for? What are the viewpoints and the perspectives of the various stakeholders? Um and then the other thing that that also came up is just in terms of stakeholders and and how we improve stakeholder engagement is do we really set up or equip those that participate in stakeholder engagement to adequately and efficiently participate in these engagements, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So not just having these stakeholder engagement, understanding the perspectives and the needs of the stakeholders, but are those that are involved in that adequately set up to do it? Do they have the tools to efficiently participate and, and get mm -hmm. their voices heard and their opinions mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, given across? Then what also came out is, is the distrust, right, between the various stakeholders in terms of late payment. You know, when, when payments are late, when we need change service providers, this creates kind of these barriers in terms of, of trust, which creates all sort of other bottlenecks and um, delays in the process. Um, mm. and, and I think something else that came up is there's, you know, there may be a legitimate need, but there's a misalignment and a disconnect um, and, and then projects end up not being used efficiently or the way that they intended to be used. Mm. And that is all about communication not, not being efficient. Mm. And just in general, in terms of systems thinking, I think what, what we tend to do is we, have, we tend to have a one-dimensional subjective view which makes us biased. And I think the system analysis um, or systems thinking tools that we've been given helps us to kind of broaden our perspective and and include the views of, of all the stakeholders which we tend to think about only how we see, see things yeah. um, and I think just again in terms of stakeholders seem to um, to operate in silos but the processes are completely integrated so there's mm. a mismatch again right it's mm -hmm. it's the silos of the stakeholders but but the processes are integrated and, yes. and that creates kind of kind of a like you said you know a messy messy story yeah. maybe i can quickly share with you the presentation um let me know as soon as you can see my screen and i really like this point that you guys are bringing out of um it's one thing to bring people to a table it's another thing to say are they empowered enough to be on that table and to be able to uh, to have meaningful conversation and contribution to the outcomes of what comes from that table. That's, yeah. Well said. Great exactly. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, is it big enough? Is it fine? Yeah. Okay, great. So just in terms of the, the main insights, it was, like I said, centered around communication and the kind of mismatch, uh, disconnect of communication in terms of the various um, stakeholders and then how do we strategically communicate? And, and that is the point I made about, you know, it's good, good and well that we have stakeholder engagements, but how well are they set up? Are they given the tools to efficiently engage at these stakeholder mm. engagements? Mm. And then just in terms of some of the, the blind spots, um, and here's something that also came up as unforeseen stakeholders um, that gets left out of the picture, right? So that mm. would be like, for example, the, the construction mafia. They are not stakeholders that that was intended to be in the picture in the first place when everything was set up right. Um, but yet they come and they make this process even more complex and more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be a potential blind spot. And then maintenance was also something that I thought was quite interesting because I think a lot of emphasis is placed on the project and get, getting the project set up. But this whole after the project process gets neglected. What is the plan afterwards um, yeah. to maintain and, and so on? And I yeah. think that's... 
that's it for me. Wow, wow, wow. Great stuff, great stuff. <clears throat> lovely, lovely engagements in these groups. Really lovely, lovely engagements. Um, and, and thank you to the different facilitators uh, around the conversations in the different groups. So what I'm just going to do is really summarize uh, what we have picked up from today. Um, and then if we have a minute or two just before we 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 close off, then we can uh, we we can uh, we we can close off the session. So I'll just summarize really what we have what we we picking up. Okay, all right. I was trying to present, and it is not allowing me to. Why is it not allowing me to? Okay, let me see again whether it allows me to present to you. So I just want to to summarize some of what we are uh, we pick up from today. The brief was for us to come up with some kind of some tools to assist us in terms of applying systems thinking. So I think it's important uh, for us to note that when we talk about systems thinking, when we talk about systems and we've talked about silos today, we want to, to try and use these three tools. And they're not, it's not the only tool. The first thing we want to do is to understand how the issues that we are dealing with are interdependent and interrelated. And we used a rich picture. Now, I do know that some of us struggled with it, but please, please, if you did do even a rough one, can you just please send it? Can you just please send it to, to us on the, on the link that has been provided? We just want to have a feel of what you drew, even if you didn't complete the process. And some of you did write to me on the side to say, whoa, where do I start? That's the point. That's the point that these issues, even when you're dealing with them, you start wondering, where do I start? I use rich pictures a lot. And the good thing with rich pictures is like, unlike text, they force you to think differently. Text, you know, the words and the language. Rich pictures force you to think symbols. What am I going to use? What am I going to depict this with? So they force a different side of your brain in, and, and, and a different side of engagement. And especially if you do them in a group as well, it forces a conversation. What are we going to call this? Or how are we going to depict this? Sometimes in communities, I've even done it as a collage. I give them magazines and create uh, magazines and newsprint, and I ask them to create a, 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 a collage, a picture of their village. And so they have to have a conversation. How are we going to represent the conflict that is going on? How are we going to represent the lack of water and so on? How are we? So they, it forces a conversation. And, and that's really helpful for us to understand how things are interrelated. So that, that's a one tool that we gave you. The second tool is to help us discuss the question of stakeholding voices, okay? Stakeholding voices, because the, as we have seen again, the moment you want to implement a, uh, an, an intervention, you've got to engage with this question of stakeholders, stakeholding voices, uh, as we heard from Carla, some stakeholders who are not there and suddenly are there now. It's very interesting in one community area that they were talking about housing and they started with a number of people who needed housing. And so they said, all right, we need, we've got a thousand people who need housing. We will create a thousand houses. We build a thousand houses. Our problems are solved. By the time they built 500, the list was still a thousand. There were others who had come in. So, so th that's a dilemma of stakeholder and stakeholding interest. So we've given us a tool to say, when you're thinking about an intervention, Think about who are the beneficiaries, who are the intended beneficiaries of this. But where there are beneficiaries, there's also quote-unquote victims, people who feel victimized by the intervention in one way or the other, who lose something. Who are the owners? Who are the sponsors that we need to do to talk to? What are the voices that we need to talk to? Who are the expertise voices we need to bring into the picture? But let's also not forget the legitimizers, people who speak on behalf of others. And just as a caveat on this, someone may have more than one voice. 
So someone may be uh, a beneficiary on, in terms of one voice and maybe an owner or even a victim on another voice. So it's important to know which voice am I hearing. The third element, the third element that uh, becomes very helpful in systems thinking is boundary critique. That's the critique of our assumptions, to question our assumptions. Because even we as interveners, we as people who are rolling out these projects, we are doing it based on particular assumptions. And we, we, we don't want to fall into the trap of assuming we are right, like the emperor's new clothes, emperor who found himself naked in the stadium. We don't want to find ourselves there having assumed we were right. And then we get there and we find we'd not test our assumptions. So this question around blind spots, unintended consequences, and especially allowing for feedback from a multiple source of uh, uh, views around what could be my blind spot? What am I missing here? What could be the unintended consequences? And trying to bring alternative voices into the conversation. So let's close with this then. And this was just really running through. So what is this thing we are calling systems thinking? I, I like this picture from Martin Reynolds that says, systems thinking is not just about the big picture. It's the big picture, systemic, and also systematic. It's the balcony and the dance floor. The dance floor and the balcony. So systems thinking is not just about big picture. It is big picture as well as the detail. It's that ladder that connects the systemic with the systematic, the systematic with the systemic. In organizations, in society, what we tend to find, that ladder is missing. So there are people who are thinking big ideas, big picture, good ideas, go to boss barracks, come up with great strategies, great plans. There are people on the ground doing the donkey work and the two shall never meet. And what we are talking about is this conversation of systems thinking between the systemic and the systematic, the systemic and the systematic. So for me, systems thinking does not give me a solution. In fact, I have kind of deleted the word solution from my vocabulary. It, I think it was Paul who mentioned, it helps me with an improvement. Because anything I put into place creates other issues that must now be managed. So it's really about trying to understand. And I walk with a question rather than an answer. It's a question. It's a process of, uh, of inquiry. So what do I finish then with? I finish with a picture that I love very much. And as I've listened to us talking again and again, to me, this picture depicts exactly what we are talking about, whether we are talking about community involvement, whether we are talking about service delivery and so on. And, and, and I know we have different interpretations. You can put them on the chat, what you see in these and how it relates to what we are talking about. But I, I, I think for me now, I think for me now, it is, it is uh, as I look at this picture, I'm assuming they've not seen the lion. So I ask myself the question, was the lion there when they came? And my storyline is the lion was not there when they came. They were looking at something very interesting and the lion has come. They haven't seen it. So my first question that I engage with is, what has changed since I embarked on this uh, strategic direction? And how am I dealing with that change? How am I uh, uh, managing that change? So what has changed around me? And somebody said earlier, the context is important. So what has changed in my context? That's my first question. My second question that I engage with around this is, um, uh, is this lion an opportunity or a threat to these people? And I remove the word or, and I say, it's both an opportunity and a threat. And I think the way many of us are doing SWOT analysis is not right. We separate opportunities from threats. In many organizations, we separate risk from strategy. The guys who do risk sit there, the guys who do strategy sit on the other side, and they never talk. To me, it's the same lion. It represents both an opportunity as well as a threat. The question is, have you seen it? Have you seen it? And I think for me, the third and final question I ask myself, what assumptions am I making? What are they helping me to see? But what are they keeping me from seeing? 
these guys are making particular assumptions which are helping them to see something, but they are keeping them from seeing something else. So that brings us to the end of our session today. I have enjoyed the interactions. There is a poll here. And please also post your pictures. We want to see those pictures. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for what you have engaged with us around this. And I hope that with systems thinking, we can go and make improvements in our service delivery and in the work that we are doing in local government and in, uh, in, in, in municipalities. And Heidi, I don't know who took the photograph. I took it from the internet. I have a disclaimer. All right. Thank you, everyone. Great stuff.